Okay, so it's only one section open this week. We might get to other stuff, but I also don't want to just uh, run through this because this week we want to talk about graphing signs and cosines. And the graphs of the signs and the cosines, I mean, we've seen them a few times already. We haven't really discussed them, but they're really important. I mean, you look at the definitions with uh, the unit circle and those definitions seem very artificial and it's hard to know why you'd care about something that was defined that way. Well, the reason we care is that the graphs of the sines and the cosines look like waves, essentially, and there are a whole lot of real-world situations that also look basically like waves. I mean, you can look at time and time and time as time passes, the tide in a harbor will go up and down. This could also be if instead of time being measured in hours, time was measured in days or weeks or months, this could also be a temperature graph. It's cold during winter, hot during summer, and it keeps going up and down, up and down, between cold and hot. It could be, this can still be time, but maybe on a shorter scale now. And this could be heart rate because people's heart rate goes down when they are sleeping and then goes up during the day, heart rate ought to oscillate something like that. So it's important that we have graphs or we have functions whose graphs look like this and the sine and the cosine are just that. And I'll be jumping back and forth between the whiteboard and Desmos, but the sine and the cosine. The first thing we should, well, I guess the first, first thing, they do look like waves. They're periodic. We talked about that. Um, the next thing we should recognize is that the graphs of the sine and the cosine look an awful lot alike. I mean, if you remember from like algebra or something, I'm failing to find the uh, the number, but the sine and the cosine are horizontal shifts of each other. Like this has a maximum at one, this has a maximum of pi over two. If we take the graph of the cosine, and we move it to the left, pi over two units. That's what this is. It's a horizontal shift. We'll talk about that later. But the sine and the cosine now look identical. So anytime you have a real world situation that you want to model using the sine or the cosine, you can use either one. I mean, maybe one will be more convenient than the other, but because of what we're seeing here, because these graphs are just horizontal shifts of each other, 
they're essentially the same thing. And that's convenient for this section because it means we'll be able to study them basically at the same time. We won't have to have a lesson on the sine graph and then a separate lesson on the cosine graph. So traditionally, when this material gets presented, I mean, the sine and the cosine are the same pattern repeated over and over again. So what we normally do is look at one period of the function. And then because the graph of the sine or the cosine is going to be that picture repeated over and over again, once we figured out what one period looks like, we know what the entire graph looks like. And let's select for the period we look at, let's take a look at the graph from zero to two pi. So one period of the sign between zero and two pi looks like that. One period of the cosine between zero and two pi looks like that. Making allowances for my artistic limitations. And again, when you look at just one period, it's making these graphs look really different, but they're not. It's the same graph, just shifted horizontally. I mean, if we go going over here, for example, if I scribbled that part of the graph out, and then looked at what happened to the right of the two pi, you see that a period that the sine and the cosine really do look the same. They're just located on different parts of the Cartesian plane. So the sine and the cosine both have what you might call points of interest. The maximum values, the minimum values, and then the zero values. And for the sine and the cosine both, those points of interest are spaced evenly on the period. So halfway through the period of the sign, there's what I'm calling a point of interest, which is a root, a value where the sign is equal to zero. Halfway through the period of the cosine, there's a point of interest. It's a different point of interest, it's a minimum value. But both the sine and the cosine have a point of interest at pi, halfway through the period. And then if we look at a fourth of the way through the period, and three fourths of the way through the period. Again, the points of interest, a maximum and a minimum value. And over here, the cosine, 
if we look at a fourth of the way through the period and three fourths of the way through the period, again, these points of interest. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is that we can change the periods of the sines and the cosines. We can mess around with the functions so that instead of having a period of two pi, maybe the sine will now have a period of five. But still, Halfway through the period will be that same point of interest to the root. And a fourth of the way through the period will be the maximum. And three fourths. of the way through the period will be the minimum. So we'll see that the period can change, but the sine and the cosine will always have the same points of interest, and they'll always be a fourth of the way through the period, half of the way through the period, and know what that pi was supposed to be, three-fourths times five, three-fourths of the way through the period. We can also have negative signs in front of the cosine or the sine. And, in a, and what having a negative sign will do is what having a negative sign will do to any function. It will flip it across the axis. But notice that um, because of the way the sine and the cosine are, putting a negative sign in front doesn't really change the shape of the graph. It just changes or seems to change where the graph is on the plane. And likewise, we can have a negative sign in front of the cosine. But again, it doesn't change the shape of the cosine. It just sort of moves it around on the plane. Like if I were to go to the grid and I were to hide everything, and I were to look at the negative cosine and the positive cosine, and then I were to hide that to stop any cheating. There's, and I were to zoom around a little. There's no way to tell these graphs apart. There's no way to tell which is the negative cosine and which is the positive cosine. I mean, even now that we have the axis back, because I've moved us over here, I can't look at this and tell the difference. And sort of the moral of this story, you know, sines and cosines look basically identical. They look like waves. We can define what are called sinusoidal functions. 
and sinusoidal functions are terribly named because they have sine right in the name. But a sinusoidal function is basically a pumped up sine or a pumped up cosine function. A sinusoidal function is going to have either this form or it's going to have this form. And because the sines and the cosines look alike, sinusoidal functions look alike. And if you've got a function, if you've got a graph or you've got a situation and you're trying to build the sinusoidal function, it's ultimately going to be down to a matter of personal preference, whether you want to use the sine or the cosine. There might be situations where one is easier than the other, but all sinusoidal functions, whether you use the sine or the cosine, look the same. They all look like waves. Is that a sinusoidal sine function or a sinusoidal cosine function? Impossible to know. So, I'll come next is a catalog a sinusoidal function has four parameters in it a b c and d what are those parameters doing and what does a sinusoidal function look like To answer both, please, let's go to our trusty graphing utility. So here's a sinusoidal function where, here, let me see. Let me set A to one, B to one. everything else to zero. So here's a sinusoidal function that in fact is just the sine function. One times the sine of one X minus zero plus zero. That's just the sine function. And let's go through and take a look at what happens. If we take First, this A and mess around with it. Okay, increasing A stretches the graph. Decreasing A to zero smushes the graph towards the X axis. If A is increasing in the negative direction, that also stretches the graph. So this A stretches the graph vertically. This B is going to control the period. This is, let me, let me adjust this viewing window so we can see more of the x-axis. So you see as I increase B, yeah, these waves are getting narrower and narrower. 
they're getting closer and closer together. Whereas if I make B, B close to zero, the waves are getting further and further apart. And this is the period of the graph. That's especially obvious here. This is a single period of the cosine. And the period of the cosine is the diff distance between the tips of the wave. Yes. So if the waves are getting close together, that distance is decreasing, and that means the period is decreasing. Whereas if the waves are getting further apart, that distance is increasing, so the period is increasing. The other parameters, C and D are not going to change. No, that's not. Yes, that is true. Are not going to change the shape of the graph, but they are going to change where the graph is located. Like, okay, this isn't quite accurate, but let's say I want this to be a temperature graph. The temperature is high during the summer, it's low during the winter, then it's high again during the summer. On a, a hypothetical planet where a day has about 60, a year has about 60 days, because I don't want to mess with that right now. Well, here, a maximum temperature is about 2.2, and a minimum temperature is negative 2.2. This comes from the A. If I change A, I change the maximum and the minimum. Oops. And I am going to go to the whiteboard and write all of this down. At the moment, we're just investigating. But we are going to get what's happening put in writing. So don't worry about that. OK. So here the maximum is about 50, or rather is exactly 50, and the minimum is negative 50. Well, I mean, that, that minimum might do for Shadron, Nebraska, but for the less uh, strange parts of the world. Maybe we want our minimum to be closer to zero. And we want our maximum to be closer to 100. So the shape of the graph is fine. We don't want to change the shape of the graph, but we do want to just move this entire graph up so that the minimum moves up to about here, and the maximum moves up to about here. Now that is precisely what this D parameter does. And if I, let's allow D to be bigger than 10, and I can just move D up, until I get about what I want, a maximum of 100, a minimum of zero. And again, this B is controlling the period. So I said, well, this is on an alien planet. 
because the period, um, a year from summer to summer seems to be about 80, about 60 days. So um, if I let this B be different, that would be changing the length of the year. But we'll get to that later. We'll do a lot of examples. For now, there's one parameter we haven't looked at, and that's a C. And again, let's imagine that this is like an alien world, and we're looking at its temperature over the course of one year. And on Earth, January 1st is the middle of winter. So we'll keep that idea with this alien world. And we'll say that at time zero, at the start of the year, it ought to be cold. In fact, let's say that the start of the year should be where we see the coldest temperature. Well, that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing our coldest temperatures at this about negative uh, 30. And we're seeing our hottest temperatures at about 90. I mean, then again, at about 90. This C here allows us to shift this curve vertically, sorry, horizontally. So we mess around with C a bit, and now our coldest temperature is occurring right at the beginning of the year, just as we want. So to summarize, and I'll put this summary in writing and give some formal names and stuff. But this A controls the height of the graph, or the vertical stretchedness of the graph. This B controls the period of the graph. This C controls the horizontal position of this graph, Move, changing C moves the graph horizontally. This D controls the vertical position of the graph, moving D shifts the graph up and down vertically. So there's our summary. Let's get this in writing and say a few words about names. So we'll start, we'll start with Give me just a second. We'll start with the amplitude. And the amplitude is the vertical stretch outedness of the graph, which the height of the graph. It's some um, controlling. If you've got a graph, what's the distance? between the maximum value and the minimum value. The amplitude though, if you think of it this way, is a little odd because this is what um, the amplitude is measuring this distance. But the amplitude isn't defined to be the distance between the maximum and the minimum values. Rather, the amplitude is defined to be half of that distance. 
And when we have a sinusoidal function, The amplitude you can just read right off, it's great. The amplitude is the absolute value of this number in front of the graph. So going back to this picture, but let's radically simplify it. Let's get rid of everything except for the A that controls the amplitude. See here, A is one. The um, maximum value is at one. The minimum value is at negative one. So the distance between the minimum and the maximum value is two, and the amplitude is half of that. Um, seeing the sign this way maybe makes that half seem a little less arbitrary because this x-axis is cutting this sign precisely into two pieces. So with this minimum, with this medium, line here, cutting this graph into halves, it's maybe a little less arbitrary that the amplitude is defined to be the distance between the x-axis and the maximum value. So if we increase the amplitude to two, well, again, that's the distance between the x-axis and the maximum. Another way of thinking about it is that the minimum is at negative two. The maximum is at positive two. So the distance between the minimum and the maximum is four. Half of four is the amplitude. Half of four is two. If you have a negative number, you just ignore the negative sign when you look at the amplitude. So here the amplitude is 1.2. The maximum is at 1.2. The minimum is at negative 1.2. The distance between these is 2.4, half of 2.4 is 1.2. Let's make this stuff with the maximum and the minimum slightly less trivial. So I've added some stuff to this sinusoidal function. I've added a D term. But the great stuff, the great thing about the sinusoidal function is that for the most part, these parameters don't interact with each other. So the fact that I have a plus three here doesn't change that this A is giving us the amplitude. And now the maximum is at five, the minimum is at one. Halfway between five and one is three. Wait. Is two. Let me try that again. Halfway between one and five is indeed three. But um, the amplitude, what am I doing? Am I doing something weird? <laughs> 
man, one of these days. Okay, let's get rid of the slider. So a maximum at five. Oh, no, I, sorry, but I mean, everything here is right. I don't, my brain just went somewhere else. What I was saying is that the trying to say, what I should have said was that the amplitude then is the distance between the maximum value and this midpoint. So this midpoint is at three, this maximum value is at five, the distance between three and five is indeed two. So all's well there. Let's see. Ugh. Well. These things happen, regroup and keep going. So A controls the amplitude. Um, let's go, let's go in order of easiness. So let's do the easiest stuff first. Probably the next easiest thing is that D. D, you can think of in a few different ways. The function way of thinking about D is that D is a vertical shift. So to think of D as a vertical shifting, let's create a D slider. So here's a sign um, that start with D at zero. So here's the sign function. The amplitude, now let's just make it a normal sine function. Here is a sine function. Currently, D is a zero. So the sine function is in its standard position. If I increase D, the graph shifts up. If I decrease D, the graph shifts down. So that's why I'd call D a vertical shift, because I'm thinking of D as moving this graph up and down as D changes. But another way of thinking about D is as an average value. And another way of thinking about that is that D is the number halfway between the minimum and the maximum. So if I draw a picture, 
this distance is the amplitude and then this distance is a D. I guess I should say the absolute value of D because D could be positive or negative. And the amplitude is the absolute value of A. So D is the vertical shift. Another way of thinking of it is halfway between the minimum and the maximum. Okay, that's all correct. And again, notice that these A's and D's are totally decoupled from one another. So the amplitude is entirely controlled by A. This Mid middle value is entirely controlled by D. There is no overlap. And the period is a similar in that the period is going to be controlled exclusively by one parameter. Sadly, the, the period is kind of weird. It's controlled entirely by B. But whereas the amplitude was just A and the vertical shift was just D, the period is not equal to B. Sad but true, the period is 2 pi divided by B. Again, I'm used to be being positive, but if you want to allow B to be negative, that's fine. You need to put an absolute value around it in there. So what does this tell you? I mean, it tells you a few things. First of all, it tells you literally this. It tells you what the period is. But also, maybe a bit unintuitive that if B is large, that makes the period small. And if B is a small, that makes the period large. So it's unintuitive in that way. Or at least I find it unintuitive. I guess I can't speak for you. So here's, heck, we've used the sign a lot. Let's use the cosine just for variety. So here B is one and the period is two pi 
divided by one, which is two pi. If I increase B, the period is going to shrink. Similarly, if I make B closer to zero, the period is going to expand, going to increase. So if we look at, for example, the following, draw one period, of y equals the cosine um five x so this thing has an amplitude of one it doesn't have any vertical shifting. And looking ahead slightly, it doesn't have any horizontal shifting. So a period of the cosine looks like that. But now instead of going from a zero to two pi, the period is 2 pi divided by 5. So it goes from 0 to 2 pi divided by 5. And now tying this in to something I said earlier, where does this graph have its minimum? Well, it doesn't look this way because I'm a terrible artist. Try that again. But the features of interest are still a fourth of the way through the period half of the way through the period, and three-fourths of the way through the period. So this minimum occurs half of the way through the period at 2 pi divided by 10. This root occurs a fourth of the way through the period, at 2 pi divided by 20, this root occurs three-fourths of the way through the period at 6 pi divided by 20. I haven't changed the amplitude, or rather the amplitude is 1, so this curve is going between a negative one and positive one. Its period is two pi over five. And those are the points of interest in it. We have not yet talked somehow, not somehow because I got confused by one of the problems I was doing, but we took a little longer than I expected. We'll have to talk about C um, on Wednesday. That's fine. As I said, I budgeted this entire week for this section.